Welcome to Afro Tales Hub channel. Let's continue with the part 4. After the coronation event where Prince Ukendu couldn't lift the ancestral staff to prove his true airship, everyone expressed disbelief. They were unable to comprehend what had transpired. Subsequently, people departed from the grounds where the coronation took place. Prince Ukendu and Princess Odon returned to their heart, shedding tears throughout the day. They felt deeply upset and disappointed. Meanwhile, Chief Yuzo reached his house and patiently awaited the return of his son, Oren. Oren had made the decision not to attend the coronation in order to avoid the pain of seeing Princess Odon again. The sight of her would only remind him of the heartbreak he experienced when she chose to marry Prince Ukendu instead of him, despite his unwavering love for her. Oren sought to evade such emotional suffering by distancing himself from the coronation event. Finally, when Oren arrived home, he found his father sitting outside with a mysterious smile on his face. As he approached, Renza asked his father why he appeared so happy and inquired about the events at the coronation. Chief Yuzo motioned for Renza to join him and proceeded to share the surprising occurrences, such as Prince Ukendu's inability to lift the staff and the head priest's declaration that he wasn't the true heir. Furthermore, Chief Yuzo mentioned that all men were requested to undergo a test for the royal blue, leaving Arenza feeling sorry for Princess Odon, whose dreams were shattered publicly. However, he also contemplated whether it was fair, considering how she had previously disregarded his love. Arenza firmly stated that he wouldn't participate in such a grand spectacle, acknowledging that he wasn't of royal lineage and believing it to be an affair for princes and nobles. Chief Yuzo insisted that Arenza set aside his feelings and accompany him to the significant test, if only to understand the desires of the ancestors. Initially, Arenza intended to argue, but his father raised his hand, signaling him to stop. With a calm yet serious demeanor, Chief Yuzo expressed his belief that something significant was occurring, which could change their lives in a profound manner. Placing a reassuring hand on Arenza's arm, he couldn't fully explain the situation but earnestly requested his son's open-mindedness and humility. He suggested that there might be more to the concept of royalty than what meets the eye. Reflecting on his father's serious countenance and considering his profound spiritual knowledge, acquired through years of practice, Arenza reluctantly agreed to accompany him. He acknowledged that he couldn't comprehend how it related to him but understood the importance and decided to see what unfolds. Chief Yuzo smiled and affectionately patted Arenza's shoulder, commending his wisdom and advised him to rest and prepare, anticipating significant changes. As they entered their hut, the village fell silent, as if awaiting a momentous event. The day after the astonishing coronation failure, Prince Ukendu was consumed by rage and humiliation. His entire life had been dedicated to ascending to the position of High King, only to have that destiny cruelly snatched away. In his arrogance, Tukendu vented his anger on those closest to him, harshly rejecting the offerings brought by the maids and berating them as foolish servants. Tukendu forcefully knocked the platters from the maids' hands, causing food to splatter all over them. In addition to verbal abuse, he resorted to physical violence, striking them with his fist and feet. The battered maids fled from his presence, spreading news of Ukendu's violent outburst throughout the kingdom. Princess Adon realized she needed to intervene before her husband's behavior spiraled completely out of control. One night, she approached his quarters cautiously, hoping to reason with him. Carefully choosing her words, she addressed him as my prince, urging him to find a way to make peace with the situation. She emphasized that losing his temper and resorting to violence would only lead to more turmoil. However, Ukendu was too consumed by resentment to listen. He turned on Adon with venomous eyes, blaming her for everything. According to him, her existence brought upon him a curse, causing the rejection of the ancestors and the loss of his birthright. Adon recoiled in shock as Ukendu continued his rageful tirade. He struck her repeatedly, venting his anger and frustration through physical violence. In pain and crying, Adon collapsed to the floor as Ukendu's attacks intensified. Amidst the assault, he screamed at her to leave, expressing his desire to have nothing to do with her. Battered and bleeding, Adon managed to escape from Ukendu's chambers, his hurtful words echoing in her ears. She had never seen such a monstrous and unhinged side of the man she had once intended to share her life with. As she fled into the night, Adon realized the full consequences of her arrogant decision to reject Oren's unconditional love years ago. Her suffering had only just begun. After being cast out by the man she had sacrificed everything for, Adon cried endlessly, regretting her choice to marry the cruel Prince Ukendu. Memories of Oren's genuine love flooded her mind. 
She remembered how he had treated her with tenderness, care, and unwavering love, never resorting to violence or prioritizing material possessions over their relationship. She realized that marrying Ukendu had been a grave mistake, and her ambition to become the queen over all five kingdoms had failed miserably. Overwhelmed with sorrow, she made the difficult decision to leave this disastrous union behind. After regaining her composure, Odon resolved to speak to her father, King Chuka, about ending her marriage to Prince Ukendu. The next morning, she embarked on the familiar journey to her father's palace in the heart of the kingdom. The guards recognized the downtrodden princess and escorted her inside to the king's chambers. As she entered, King Chuka looked at his daughter with sadness in his eyes. He observed the bruises and pain evident on her face, a clear sign of the suffering she had endured. Odon, addressing her father, tried to maintain a steady voice as she began her plea. After much torment, she expressed her desire to dissolve her marriage to Prince Ukendu. With a sense of shame, she admitted that her father had warned her about the path she was choosing, but her pride had blinded her. Now, she had paid a terrible price for abandoning true love. To her surprise, King Chuka showed no sympathy, simply nodding as if he had anticipated this outcome. He sternly reminded her of the arrogant choice she made years ago when she discarded noble Arenza for the pursuit of grandeur and status with Prince Ukendu. The king made it clear that there would be consequences for such actions, cautioning her against betraying her own heart and the heart of the man who loved her unconditionally. Despite Aiden's attempts to protest, her father silenced her, highlighting her obsession with royalty and her disregard for the path set by the ancestors. Disappointment tinged his voice as he lectured her, making her feel like a foolish child once again. Tears streamed down Aiden's cheeks as she absorbed the weight of her father's reprimand, acknowledging a grave error in judgment that had led her to this path of suffering and regret. The king expressed his weariness and stated that she must endure the consequences of her decision, no matter how painful they may be. Desperate for peace after the injustice and abuse she had endured at Prince Ukendu's hand, Odon pleaded with her father to allow her to seek freedom from the wretched marriage. However, King Chuka remained uncompromising, reminding her that she knew the man she had bound herself to in the sacred vows. He emphasized that if Ukendu had shown his arrogance and cruelty, it was a reality she had chosen when she accepted his ring. The king rose from his throne, signaling the end of the discussion, and summoned the royal guards to escort Adon back to Prince Ukendu's lands, as it was her rightful place. He warned her of severe consequences for any further disobedience to the path she had chosen. As the guards firmly gripped her arms and led her towards the exit, the disgraced princess looked at her unforgiving father with imploring eyes, questioning his cruelty and pleading for mercy. King Chuka remained steadfast and impassive, understanding that tough love was necessary to break through Aiden's stubborn delusions. He reminded her that she had been warned repeatedly about discarding Arenza's pure devotion, and now she must face the reality she had manifested through her arrogance. She had to find the humility to overcome it or remain a prisoner of her poor choices forever. With that, Princess Adon was unceremoniously escorted from the palace under strict guard, her cries of dismay echoing through the halls, reverberating against the walls that had witnessed a spoiled and naive childhood years ago. Now, she faced punishment as the woman she had become, driven by arrogance and forced to confront the consequences she had foolishly invited upon herself. With only four days remaining until the significant market day event, where all men would be tested to determine the true heir to the throne, Prince Ukendu found himself restless on a sweltering afternoon. Restlessly, he struggled to devise a plan for his next move. Deeply upset, he realized that despite years of preparation to become the next king, he had failed to lift the special staff during the ceremony. Ukendu slowly made his way to the throne room, drawn to the sight of his late father's magnificent king's throne, now vacant. His furrowed brows reflected confusion and denial as he pondered how he had missed such an incredible opportunity despite his meticulous readiness. After pacing back and forth, Ukendo arrived at a desperate conclusion. He decided to seek out a powerful seer living in a distant land, rumored to possess the gift of identifying the true heir. If the seer named someone else as the next king, Ukendo planned to eliminate that person, eradicating the competition. He also intended to employ dark magic to purify Princess Odon, enabling her to pass any required tests. With this perilous scheme in mind, Ukendu believed he could try again at the next market day event to lift the ancestral staff and claim his rightful place as the High King, regardless of who stood in his way. Determined to seize the crown by any means necessary, he was willing to commit treacherous acts against innocent lives. Ukendu was certain that this twisted plan would provide him another opportunity to lift the special staff and become the High King. He was prepared to do anything, including lying, hurting, or killing, 
to attain the crown. Filled with resolve, Ukendu informed Princess Adon that they urgently needed to embark on a journey to find a powerful seer. Adon didn't comprehend the reasons behind it but unquestioningly agreed, remaining blindly devoted to assisting Ukendu in his quest for kingship, regardless of the cost. As they prepared for their clandestine journey, an eerie sensation settled over the palace, as if the ancient spirits sensed impending trouble or heralded a sign of forthcoming adversity. Prince Ukendu and Princess Odon decided to set off on their journey early the next morning, their minds filled with hope and expectations about the insights that awaited them. As the bustling early morning light peaked over the horizon, Ukendu and Odon embarked on their journey to find the wise seer rumored to hold answers. Their motives were twofold, to uncover the truth behind the mysterious events that unfolded during the coronation ceremony, preventing Ukendu from claiming the throne, and to seek some form of spiritual cleansing for Adon, suspecting her to be the obstacle hindering his rightful ascent to power. Upon reaching the seer's distant abode, they barely dismounted their horses before she began speaking, as if anticipating their arrival. Immediately, she divulged something significant about Ukendu's family. The seer revealed that Ukendu was not his late father's first son. She recounted a tale of how before Kendu's father became king, he had another son with a different woman. Subsequently, he married Ukendu's mother and had more children, including Ukendu himself. Aware of the existence of this secret son, the seer chose not to divulge the truth, fearing Ukendu's dark plans to eliminate him. Instead, she purposely conveyed confusing messages to him. Despite Ukendu's increasing anger, the seer persisted, recounting how the mother of the hidden son sought refuge in a distant forest during her pregnancy. There, she received assistance from a man gathering leaves for herbal treatments, who aided her in giving birth. Tragically, the woman passed away during childbirth, and the son grew up oblivious to his royal lineage. At this revelation, Ukendu's fury erupted, and he stood up, shouting in a fit of rage. Defiantly, he declared that the secret firstborn son would never be allowed to seize his crown and kingdom, which he had been groomed for since birth. Ukendu went on to proclaim that he would scour every village and forest to locate and eliminate this perceived threat before they could assume the throne. However, the seer remained unaffected by Ukendu's angry threats. She sternly warned him against harming the predicted heir, stressing that the powerful spirits of their ancestors had chosen him. The seer cautioned that if Ukendu dared defy this person's destiny, the ancient guardians would employ their supernatural powers against him. Despite the seer's admonitions, Ukendu paid no heed. As a spoiled prince accustomed to getting his way, he disregarded her counsel, consumed by his own ambitions. He dismissed the seer's warnings as mere old stories and paid no attention. In a fit of anger, he left, determined to locate and eliminate the supposed lost heir by any means necessary. He vowed to defeat anyone who dared challenge his plans to become king. The arrogant prince was willing to go to any lengths to claim the throne he believed was his birthright. However, the wise seer cautioned that the prophesied true heir was far more prepared than Ukendu to lead the kingdom with fairness. This individual had learned invaluable lessons on gracefully handling problems and guiding people with genuine compassion, unlike Ukendu and his selfish ambition. The seer implored the better prince to be humble and accept the will of the gods and ancestors, as their decree represented the right path that everyone must follow. But Ukendu remained defiant, adamantly stating that such a thing would never be allowed to happen. With those disrespectful words, he stormed off angrily, determined to locate and utterly destroy the alleged firstborn son of his father. The seer could only sadly shake her head as she watched them depart, knowing that human greed and destiny were igniting a significant conflict. Only time would reveal the ultimate victor. Upon returning home after meeting the seer, Prince Ukendu retreated to his chambers and remained lost in thought until nightfall. Troubled, a strange and dark thought entered his mind. With time rapidly running out before the market day event and all his previous schemes failing, he decided to attempt bribing the powerful high priest who oversaw the sacred ceremonies of the five kingdoms. Ukendu planned to offer the chief priest a temptation too enticing to refuse and, in return, seek his assistance in seizing the crown. Meanwhile, in her own private room, Princess Odon grappled with a completely different inner conflict. She began reflecting on the years spent with her former lover, a kind and supportive man who had stood by her side during her darkest moments, exhibiting endless patience and empathy. With a tinge of sadness, Odon realized that no other person, not even her husband Ukendu, could ever make her feel truly loved and valued like Oren did. Instead of the endless love Ukendu promised, the spoiled prince had only brought hatred, suffering, and physical harm into Aiden's life. As memories of Oren's kindness rushed back, 
filling her with deep regret and longing, Odon knew what she had to do. In the morning light, she decided she would leave Ukendu and search for Renza, hoping he could find it in his heart to forgive her terrible mistakes. While the arrogant Prince Ukendu grew increasingly desperate and erratic in his troubled mind, at night, Princess Aiden's thoughts became clear, filled with a newfound sense of purpose, despite the immense challenges awaiting her. A possible path back to the love and happiness she foolishly discarded finally revealed itself to her. Though it might be too late to make amends, deep inside, Odon knew she had to make an effort to seek forgiveness. If not for herself, then for the opportunity to reunite with the only man who truly understood her authentic self. The next morning, Prince Ukendu hastily departed to locate the dwelling of the chief priest, while Odon also set off to find Arenza. In the peaceful village, on a beautiful morning, Oren sat outside his modest home, skillfully playing rhythmic beats on his well-worn drum. The rich and soulful melodies resonated through the air, each strike of the drumstick carrying profound emotion. From a distance, Princess Odon heard the achingly familiar sounds, and her feet moved instinctively, drawn inexplicably toward the source of the haunting music. As she approached, memories flooded back to her in vivid detail. Odon remembered the joyful moments when she first met Arenza, the talented drummer. She could clearly recall how his music used to fill her with happiness and a desire to dance with excitement. His music brought her a sense of calm and peace, as if she had found her rightful place. But these sweet and idyllic moments were now overshadowed by the bitter reality of the choices she had made. Aiden's selfish pursuit of wealth and status had robbed her of the beautiful life that could have been, replacing it with profound regret and suffering. Tears welled up in her eyes as she watched Oren, his eyes closed, pouring his heart and soul into each drumbeat. Overwhelmed, Odon slowly approached until she stood just a few feet away from the man whose unconditional love she had recklessly discarded years ago. She yearned to return to those days of innocent bliss they had shared. Finally, Oren opened his eyes, breathing heavily from the intensity of his musical catharsis. When his gaze fell upon the unexpected sight of Odon standing there, he froze. A myriad of emotions flickered across his face, shock, lingering sadness, and adoration. But then he looked at her more closely, noticing the wounds and bruises on her delicate face, and felt a sense of pity for her above all else. In a gentle voice filled with concern, Arenza asked, What happened to you? Who did this? Tears glistened in Aiden's eyes as she began to tell Oren about the suffering she had endured. She recounted the suffering she had endured at the hands of her cruel husband, Prince Ukendu. Almost every day, he would subject her to beatings and cruel words. Ukendu angrily blamed Adon for his failure to become king and for his embarrassment when he wasn't chosen by the sacred staff during the crowning ceremony. He held her responsible for not being considered the true leader of the kingdoms. As Adon shared these painful moments with Arenza, her sadness overwhelmed her, and she collapsed to the ground, holding on to the hem of Oren's simple clothes, crying uncontrollably. Please, I'm begging you, she cried. Take me back. Forgive me for my pride and selfishness. I just want to return to the loving relationship I foolishly abandoned. However, Arenza's face hardened at her request. The pain from when she had betrayed his unconditional love still haunted him. He shook his head firmly and distanced himself from the weeping princess. How dare you come back here after what you did to me, he yelled, his voice filled with anger and pain. I loved you with all my heart, and you betrayed me for money and status. The heated argument attracted the attention of Chief Yuzo, who was inside the simple house. He hurried to the door and witnessed the chaotic scene, Odon crying at Arenza's feet. Realizing what was happening, his anger intensified. You. Yuzo said angrily, walking toward Odon with clenched fists. How dare you come here after abandoning true love for material things? After everything we sacrifice for you. Yuzo towered over the trembling princess, years of pain and disappointment pouring out. We accepted you even when you faced challenges. We defended you when others mistreated you, and you repaid our kindness by forsaking it all to be with a terrible man for his wealth. As Yuzo harshly berated her, his voice grew louder, carrying all the pain he had bottled up inside. Adon could only shrink back, feeling dreadful about the consequences of her choices. Finally, Yuzo grabbed Aiden's arms tightly, forcing her to stand up. He pointed towards the path leading out of their village, instructing her to leave. I want you out of my sight, you selfish and ungrateful woman, he bellowed, punctuating his words with a forceful shove that sent Adon stumbling. You made your miserable choice long ago, and you'll have to live with it. Arenza stepped forward, 
his pain expression revealing the depth of his heart. He's right, Adon. You are a married woman now, trapped in the dishonorable path you proudly chose. His words pierced her deeply. Don't ever think I'll forgive you for discarding my love as if it meant nothing. Go back to the luxurious life you picked over me and stay there. With those harsh words echoing in her mind, Adon turned and walked away, feeling utterly devastated. The two men she had loved so deeply watched her departure with unforgiving eyes until she vanished from sight. As Aiden's sorrowful cries faded, Chief Yuzo placed a comforting hand on his son's shoulder. Despite their broken hearts, he believed they had handled the situation with dignity and honor. You did the right thing by pushing her away, Yuzo said seriously. A love that was discarded so easily shouldn't be taken back hastily. Arenza could only nod, feeling too sorrowful and still in love to utter a word. Deep down, he knew that Aiden's sudden appearance, filled with remorse and a plea for forgiveness, wasn't enough to make up for the immense betrayal she had committed against their relationship. Perhaps, someday, if she became humble and truly understood the gravity of her actions, there might be a chance to set things right. But for now, it was crucial to stand by their decision and resist yielding to her sudden regret, even though it pained them deeply. As the two weary men returned home, their hearts heavy with sorrow. They were aware that being tough on Adon actually helped her in the long run. Sometimes, the toughest lessons lead us to where we are meant to be. Prince Ukendo arrived at the chief priest's place and made a surprising offer upon arrival. The offer involved sharing half of the money and wealth from the five kingdoms in exchange for guaranteeing Ukendo's coronation as the new high king. The chief priest, blinded by greed, readily accepted Ukendo's corrupt offer, and they swiftly struck their secret deal. As part of their sinister plot, the chief priest planned to create a fake replica of the ancestral staff and arrange mystical charms that would enable only Ukendo to successfully lift it during the market day event. However, unbeknownst to the two sneaky individuals, the main priest's own son accidentally overheard all the details of the evil plan while they were discussing how to cheat for their own gain. The young man was shocked to discover that his father, who was supposed to be a religious leader, was willing to break sacred rules for money. Feeling a strong sense of responsibility, he promised himself that he would stop their bad plan and secretly ruin his father's attempts to cheat in the special ceremony for Okendu, even if it meant risking himself. While the main priest was making the fake staff, his son watched carefully, waiting for the right time to act. When his father wasn't looking, the young man sneaked in and switched the fake staff with the real one. With the fake staff safely hidden away, the main priest had no idea that his own son had tricked him. The main priest continued preparing magic spells to ensure that only Ukendu could lift the fake idol during the upcoming ceremony, unaware of the switch. In the days leading up to the market day event, Ukendu felt confident that his bribery had secured his victory, unaware of the secret actions of the high chief priest's son. The proud prince didn't realize that the advantage he had obtained was merely a trick. Finally, the long-awaited market day event arrived, and people from all five kingdoms gathered in the expensive kingdom square. Kings, nobles, villagers, and individuals from all walks of life congregated to be tested and potentially revealed as the true heir to the throne. Prince Ukendu, aware of his bribery actions, appeared relaxed with a confident smile, eagerly anticipating the test, convinced that his deal with the high priest would ensure his successful lifting of the ancestral staff. Meanwhile, Chief Yu and Atsi were present among the crowd, with the wise healer wearing a mysterious knowing smile on his weathered face. Despite Aaron's doubts about his royal lineage, he sensed that his father knew something he didn't on this fateful day. The atmosphere was filled with anticipation as the high priest called for silence and commenced the sacred rituals. Men of all ages stepped forward one by one to try lifting the ancient, ornately carved staff from its resting place, but each attempt ended in failure as the staff remained unmoved. As the day went on, many men tried, but none could lift the staff, regardless of their strength or importance. By evening, Almost everyone had been tested except for Oren and two other men. Chief USO then called for Oren to step forward, giving him the impression that his father was withholding something from him. Oren questioned his father, asking, Father, are you keeping something from me? Nervously, Chief USO gave his permission to proceed with the test and advised Oren not to ask any more questions. Oren, feeling nervous, followed through and walked into the testing area. The two men in front of him attempted but couldn't lift the staff. Suddenly, Oren was the only one left, and the crowd grew quiet. Princess Odana and Prince Ukendo appeared worried. Then, Prince Ukendo stood up confidently from his seat and began mocking Oren. 
fully convinced that he had bribed the chief priest, Prince Ukendu declared with an arrogant sneer that Oren was unfit to lead or even be considered for the throne. He proclaimed loudly that there was no need to test this commoner, referring to Oren as an ordinary drummer boy. Ukendu insisted that Oren should step aside and let him try again, believing his bribes would secure his success. Agreeing with the prince's demand, the compromised chief priest nodded and stated that Ukendu deserved another opportunity in case there had been an error earlier. Ukendu pushed his way to the front of the line and positioned himself directly in front of Oren, showing his disdain for the humble villager. With a proud smile, Ukendu walked up to the special platform and tried to lift the old staff, exerting all his strength. However, to his surprise and disappointment, the staff didn't move at all. The watching crowd couldn't believe it either, as they had expected Ukendu to easily become the king. If you want to see how the story ends, please write, continue, in the comments. Subscribe to not miss the conclusion of this captivating story, as you will be amazed by its unexpected outcome. Thank you for watching, see you in the part 5. May God bless you.